So the last big topic we're going to talk about in this class is activity-based costing, with a little detour to performance measurement near the end. We're going to talk about activity-based costing in the context of a manufacturing firm, although it's still true that service firms could also use this methodology. So ABC is in contrast to our traditional costing system and deals with overhead. We know what our direct materials and direct labor are. There's not really a whole lot you can do to play around with that stuff. But the way that we calculate and apply our overhead to our product can have a significant impact on how we determine that product's total cost. Back in Chapter 11, we calculated our total overhead costs and then we chose a driver of some sort. Labor hours, machine hours, pounds of raw material, input measures. Or perhaps we based it on the amount of product that would come out, regardless of what we chose it was a case of using a singular measure, and that would be applied across the board for all the products. ABC, on the other hand, goes deeper and says, so we spent a bunch of money on these overhead costs. Why did we spend that money? What are the activities that we are doing that's causing this overhead to be incurred? And once we know that, then we can apply the overhead to various products based on how much they rely on those activities. For instance, let's say that we have a product that requires a lot of engineer time, and another product that requires very little. It would make sense that we would apply those engineer salaries differently to those two products. So when we talk about ABC, we're talking about identifying all of these activities, from the most trivial to the most important, making sure that we know where it is that we are really spending this overhead. So for instance, let's say we begin with a sales order. That received order might trigger a raw materials purchase. And that purchase would then trigger the receiving department and testing. And then we finally get to the final assembly. So we can see as we go through this process exactly what is going on under the hood, if you will. And at each step along the way, we are generating costs. Costs are generated here because we have our employees taking orders and we have telecommunications infrastructure and the like. They're generated here because we've got a purchasing guy and we've got warehousing guys. And all of that stuff happens before our workers insert tab A into flap B. So now, once we've gone through the process, and it can be very expensive and time consuming, we've got the ability to do a couple of things with that information. The first is on the accounting side. Understanding where and why we spend that money will help us properly calculate our product costs. And what's so important about that? Well, if we don't know how much it costs us, how are we going to set our prices? And let's go back to Chapter 12 in our cost volume profit analysis. We use those costs to help us figure out how much of the product we need to sell and at what price. If our costs are wrong, then when we calculate our desired sales for a target profit level, we're going to be missing the mark. But there's more to this than just cost allocation. Simply going through this process can be value added to us from a management and control standpoint. Because what we're doing is going through our business top to bottom and identifying everything that we're doing, all those activities. And once we know what it is we're doing, we can then identify places where we can achieve cost savings. Some costs are value added, the assembly process, the testing process, and the like. But some costs aren't value added, warehousing and transfer costs, overtime and shift differentials. These are costs that the customer is not going to be willing to reimburse us for, and if we eliminated completely from our business, there would be no decrease in demand for our product. These are the sorts of things that pop out of our ABC analysis. So now let's look at that cost allocation thing a little more closely. The book goes through an example that shows that when you do your overhead calculation using a singular driver, we can have some serious funkiness going on. And we're going to go through another example here in class. The upshot to all this is that if we produce multiple products that require different overhead costs, the allocation of those costs are not necessarily going to be proportional to any one observable input or output. And of course, we should be able to see that funkiness there can impact our planning procedures such as cost volume profit analysis. If our calculations are based on a certain cost allocation, and that's wrong, we're going to be in trouble. So let's go through the ABC process, first in the abstract, and then we'll work out a numerical example that reinforces the example in the book. So we've got this five-step process here, and while I'm going to squeeze it all into a single slide, it is important to understand that this is a costly process. It's likely going to require external consultants coming in and performing interviews and putting a fresh set of eyes on our operations to make sure that nothing gets missed just because we've gotten complacent with the way things are. 
So what it is that we do? Well, we do a complete flow chart along the lines of what I did with that purchase order coming in a couple slides ago. We find every activity that's going on at the firm from the mailroom to billing to shipping. And once we've identified all these things, the next step is going to be to calculate the costs that we incur at each step. How much does it really cost us to run our receiving department, or do testing, and so on. Now, for each of these activities on which we're spending money, we need to figure out why it is that we're spending that money. We spend money on warehousing. Why do we spend money on warehousing? Because our inventory takes up a lot of space and we have to put it somewhere. So perhaps the driver for inventory warehousing is product volume. Or we spend money on product testing and our driver would be circuit boards tested. So now that we've figured all that out, it's time to start measuring. Just how many cubic feet of inventory are we storing during the year? How many circuit boards are we purchasing? Once we know that, we'll be able to come up with a per unit cost for that particular activity, and that's what we're going to use for our product cost calculations. Because let's say we make a product that uses a bunch of bulky stuff. That product is going to require a lot of warehousing, whereas a product made up of very small components will require significantly less. Or say we make products with different levels of technological complexity. One product uses five of those circuit boards, and one product only uses one. Now that we know how much it costs us per cubic foot of storage or per circuit board tested, we can come up with much more accurate product costs for each of our products. So here's our horribly contrived example to prove the point. Just like in those infomercials, results are not typical, actual results may vary. But this is a fun bunch of numbers to run. So here we are with our three products, and we're told what our direct labor and our material costs are. And again, that's not the focus of what we're doing here. The more interesting stuff is this stuff down here. The drivers that we're going to use for our overhead application. That's where we're going to find the funkiness. And so we see that we've got about 1.2 million dollars of total overhead, and it's made up of these four items. Each of these four items has an individual driver. Our handling costs are based upon the pounds of material used, for instance. But we need to begin with our traditional costing to see where we would be if we used a single driver, such as labor hours. So let's do this calculation. What is our per hour overhead cost, and how much of that $1.2 million is going to each of the three products? Well, hearkening back to Chapter 11, we take our total overhead of $1.2 million, divide by our total of 80,000 direct labor hours, and that will give us a per hour overhead rate of $15.36 per hour. And for our traditional costing system, we would take that $15.36 and apply it in a linear manner for each of our products. Product X, which uses 40,000 hours, will absorb $614,500 of overhead cost. Product Y will use just a little less than that, 537,688, and then Product C, which isn't particularly labor intensive, will absorb the remainder, or $76,813. So now we've got all the information we need for our costing. Let's lay it all out and analyze it. So for Product X, what do we have? We've got $180,000 of direct labor and direct material costs that was given. And then we just calculated how much overhead should be applied. That's the $614,000 up here. So to produce product X, it's costing us a total of $794,500. Now we're making 80,000 units, so our per unit cost is just under $10. We're selling them for 11 bucks a pop, giving us $1.07 in profit, or about a 10% margin, give or take a bit. Not too shabby. Yay us. Now we can do the same thing with product Y and product Z. Feel free to do them on your own, and then restart the recording. Again, we take our direct costs as given, and then apply in that overhead we calculated up above based on direct labor hours. We discover that we're taking a loss on product Y, and we're making a killing on product Z. So what are the decisions we might make about these products? It looks like we should concentrate on pushing product Z, and either eliminate product Y, or see if we can't outsource its production to someone else if we're bound and determined to offer it to our customers. That seems like the obvious solution to our problem. Of course, as I promised, this is a horribly contrived example, so we can expect that when we look more deeply at the numbers, we'll find that this was a horrible decision for us to make. Let's take that deeper look now. Let's look at all of these individual drivers and identify where and why we are spending that $1.2 million in overhead costs.
so we incurred materials handling costs of $700,000. That's the wages for our warehouse guys, and the gasoline we use, and the depreciation on the forklifts. And it looks like we're moving 1 million pounds of material a year. So that's going to give us an overhead application rate of 70 cents per pound of material. Those products that require the most material handling will absorb most of the costs, and those products that require little will absorb much less. Rather than saying we've got $1.2 million of total overhead that's going to get applied across the board, we're saying that this particular $700,000 is being driven by a different driver than all of the other costs, so it makes sense for us to do it separately. Next up, scheduling and setup. We've got to pay the engineers to come in and recalibrate the machines, or something like that. We spend $132,000 of costs throughout the year. Production required 55 setups, so each setup is costing us $2,400. Again, this is $132,000 that used to live in that $1.2 million of total overhead and is being allocated now on something better than direct labor hours. Our utilities and depreciation. That's per machine hour, right? And that would make sense. The more we use the machines, the more quickly they wear out and need to be replaced, and the more electricity they're pulling through the wires. So we've got 345,000 divided by 75,000 machine hours, yielding a rate of $4.60 per machine hour. And then our indirect materials of 52,000 will be apportioned based on those direct labor hours. But this is really a tiny component of our total cost, and we're allocating only 65 cents per direct labor hour now. Our total costs, if we add all this good stuff up right here, is still that $1.2 million, but we're now allocating them differently, shifting away from direct labor, and now allocating most of our cost based on direct materials and based on machine hours. So with this in mind, let's take another look at what it's going to cost us to produce this stuff, now that we've got a new set of costs. Looking at product X, we of course start with our $180,000 of direct material and direct labor. That hasn't changed. All that's changed is the way that we're applying that overhead. And then we come to our materials handling. Product X requires 600,000 pounds of materials, and at 70 cents per pound of materials, we're going to be applying $420,000 of cost to this product. It requires 20 setups, and at 2400 per setup, that means $48,000 of overhead. Utilities will be 69000 and indirect materials will be twenty six. So we've now got a new cost for our inventory. It's costing us $743,000 to produce that inventory. Our old cost was about 795 or so, so this is a pleasant surprise. Let's turn to product Y. We start with our direct materials and direct labor, and we've got 300,000 pounds used, and 25 setups, and 20,000 machine hours, and 35,000 direct labor hours, giving us another brand new cost. And we can do the same thing with product Z. Now before we compare this total cost to our original, let's take a quick look at the allocations. Where did we see most of the cost being generated? Up here, in materials handling, was a big chunk of it. And how much materials handling did product Y use? Well, about 30% or so, give or take. But under our traditional cost allocation, we applied almost half of the total overhead cost to product Y because that was based down here on our direct labor hours. And look at product Z. There's a funkiness in the relationship between drivers here, too. Product Z uses a tiny amount of labor, but not such a tiny amount of materials, and more than half of the total machine hours. So hopefully you can see that now we're going to end up with quite different product costs than we did under the traditional method. Okay, so let's redo our analysis with our new costs. Feel free to stop the recording and do it on your own first. Product X costs us $743,000 to produce, and we've got those 80,000 units, so we're looking at a new cost of $9.29 per unit. And as we saw before, it's costing us a little less to produce than we thought, and our margin has now increased to about 16%. Next is product Y, which was our pig. We do that same math, and what do we see? Our unit cost has dropped all the way down to $13.37, which means that our $17 price tag, we're actually making a killing on this product. A 21% margin. Rock on! And why is this? Because we just shifted away about $150,000 of overhead out of this product line. And where did it go? Well, if product X and product Y are both costing us less than we thought, all of that excess cost is going to go somewhere. 
and that somewhere must be product Z. So let's look at the new version of product Z's cost, and what do we see? It turns out that we've actually been taking a beating on this product. And why is this? Well, this is a capital intensive product. It requires tons of machine hours and virtually no labor. But we had been doing our allocation based on labor hours, so we significantly understated the true cost of this product. And just in case anyone had forgotten what we did not too many minutes ago, we had decided to get out of the product Y market and try to focus on selling a lot more product Z. And it wouldn't have been too long before we went the way of the fish stand. Now, as I said, this problem was horribly contrived to make these numbers ridiculously large. But the bottom line is that when we have diverse products that require different types of inputs, we can have this sort of dysfunctionality in our cost structure. Now let's turn to the cost management side. Like I said before, when we go through this analysis, we're going to end up with what is essentially a flowchart thing that maps out our entire business. I've thrown together a very basic one for a custom automobile manufacturer, keeping in mind that I know virtually nothing about automobiles or how they're manufactured. We start with the orders being taken, which sets the process in motion. And the money we spend on the order receipt side is driven by the number of orders that we take. Now recall our product cost versus period cost split, or our financial reporting distinction of cost versus expense. What sort of cost is this order taking activity? It's a period cost, right? And for financial reporting, it would be expensed in the current period as a selling expense. This wouldn't go into our product cost calculation that we did on the prior slide. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be aware of these costs and what it is that's causing us to incur them. From a cost management standpoint, we're looking at the money we're spending and why, trying to identify places where we can trim costs without sacrificing product quality, such as order taking. So we've got the order and the purchasing people get set into motion. The cost driver there is the number of purchase orders filled out. Once the stuff is ordered, it comes in and it's tested. Each item that comes in needs to get tested, so the more stuff we order, the more testing costs we face. And we put everything in storage, and the more materials we've got, the more it costs us to store it. And then finally we get to the assembly process where we put together all the components. Meanwhile, we're forming the chassis out of steel, and that gets brought into the work floor for final assembly. And then we ship the finished goods to our customers. Now looking at all the costs that we're facing here, what are our customers willing to pay for? That is, which of these costs are value added and which are dead weight costs? Well obviously they're paying for the raw materials that we're buying. And they're paying for non-junk, so this testing here is pretty important. And they're paying for our expertise at putting this stuff together, so that's the chassis forming over here and the assembly over here. And the rest of those costs are non-value added. Where can we find ways to cut those costs? Well, up here at the order taking process, maybe we can automate that. Anyone notice that you can make hotel and airline reservations online now? And when you call their 800 numbers, the first thing they tell you is that you can find the cheapest prices online. That's because they're trying to minimize that cost for the majority of people who don't need to speak with a customer service rep. And here in our purchasing area, maybe we can batch our purchases to be done two days a week rather than having purchasing folks here Monday through Friday. And storage. That's just wasted money. Most people have heard of the concept of just-in-time inventory. Just-in-time has us holding in warehouses just barely enough raw material to keep the production floor supplied, but nothing else. Why tie up all that money in inventory and then pay to store it? None of these costs add anything to our product, and all it takes is one competitor to figure out a way to eliminate or cut some of that stuff, and all of a sudden we've been undercut. So this is a management control sort of thing, and I think a lot of firms can get quite a bit of value out of this process. The concept of lean production is based in this, finding all those places of waste and trimming them down, sending that money straight to the bottom line and increasing competitiveness. Now as I said before, going through the ABC system can be very costly, both in terms of hiring outside specialists and the time management needs to spend working on that instead of their other duties. And then, once we've done the cost analysis, we need to be tracking multiple costs and multiple drivers. And as always, we have to weigh the benefits against the costs of generating those benefits. So which types of firms would not get a lot out of implementation of ABC costing? Well, companies that produce homogeneous products, for one. The example we just did showed that the costing issue came about because we had a couple products that were labor intensive and a product that was capital intensive, and using that singular driver misapplied costs. 
But say we make donut holes, and some are filled or some aren't. Or we make 10 varieties of golf balls, all of which go through essentially the same production system, just with different raw materials. In those cases, even if we used multiple drivers, we're probably going to find ourselves applying overhead pretty much in the same proportions. Smaller companies may not be able to afford the implementation of an ABC system, the same way that they may not be able to implement LIFO inventory. That's not true across the board, and we'll see some indicators on the next slide, but probably a mom and pop operation isn't going to have that level of sophistication. And, of course, companies with little to no overhead would get little from an ABC system. If overhead is trivial, how we go about allocating it is a non-issue. Conversely, what sorts of companies could make use of ABC? Well, companies with diverse products that require different sorts of overhead activities to make them run. Say we're Kraft and we make cheese products and Oreos and Crystal Light. Dairy requires refrigeration in a way that Oreos don't. And Oreos require baking in a way that Crystal Light doesn't. So, it may make sense for that sort of company to fine-tune its overhead allocation. Larger companies, who can better absorb the cost, and are more likely to have bloated operations generating waste that can be trimmed. And, of course, companies with lots of overhead costs. Now, when I first started teaching this class, I had no idea how this stuff worked since it had been a decade or more since I'd studied any of this stuff. So I went back to my old managerial textbook from when I was in college and did some reading up. So this doesn't come from our textbook, but I think it's a really good list of indicators that we may want to explore activity-based costing. Kind of like, you may be a redneck if, here's you might want ABC if. The source is footnoted in your notes. The first is that there's a disagreement between what the folks on the production floor think the cost of a product is and what the accountants think it is. For instance, going back to the example we just did, the production manager sees how much more capital intensive product Z is than X and is seeing those electricity bills come in. They're the folks who know the best what the true cost of these products are. Further, say your production folks are telling you they think that you should get out of a product that we up in corporate headquarters is raking in the money. Same deal. Trust your factory folks. Say we've got a product that's very complicated to produce. It's got multiple steps and is perhaps assembled in a couple different locations. And yet, when we price it the same way we price our other products, we seem to be making a killing on it. That sort of situation shouldn't pass the sniff test. It would be one thing if we knew that we were charging a substantial premium for the product. But if we're not, and yet still are recognizing lots of gross profit, it's entirely possible that we're just missing the boat on something. Continuing with this, we've got products with high profit margins, but no one else seems to be selling it. Well, what did we learn from economics class? The answer is typically not much, but we should at least remember that supply and demand thing, right? And if the demand for the product is high enough to allow for us to sell at a huge profit, the supply should increase due to competitors entering the market. And yet they haven't. Perhaps they know something we don't know. Lastly, say we and our competitors are both producing the same product and their prices seem unreasonably low. If we sold at that price, we'd be losing money. There's two things that could make this happen. First, maybe they've found a cheaper way to produce the product. They could have gone through the ABC process and identified non-value-added costs and eliminated them. And that means we need to do it too to compete. Second, maybe we're looking at our product Y in which we miscalculated costs, and if we used activity-based costing, we would discover that the product cost is much less than we expected. Okay, drumroll. Last topic of the semester performance measurement. As I said before, the accountants have sort of grabbed this as a topic under our control, but I would expect you're going to be learning a lot more about this in your management classes. But it's true that regardless of what measure we choose to use, the information we get to judge that measure is typically coming out of the accounting department one way or the other. So here we are. So the measures of performance we've looked at so far in this class are things like ROE and ROA and gross profit margin and net income and things like that. And while those are great measures for the firm in the aggregate, they aren't very helpful when we start to carve down into the firm and we want to look at the performance of a division or a department. IBM's net income doesn't really say a whole lot about how Bill and tech support performed this year. So the first thing we need to be aware of is what sort of division we're looking at. The first is a cost center, which does nothing but spend money. There is no revenue generation being performed here. So, for instance, this is the mailroom, or shipping and receiving. 
or this is that tech support call center for our employees, or patient billing. Profit and loss is meaningless to these guys because there's no revenue, only expense. So, if we're determined to look at financial information as a measurement tool, we're pretty well stuck with comparing to budget. And of course, we need to keep in mind what we talked about last class with respect to budgets. If they aren't achievable, they won't motivate our employees. Next, we can move up a step and look at a profit center, which generates both revenues and expenses. So here we're going to have a P&L statement that we can look at and see what net income or loss was for the division. So here is that fictional pediatric practice we talked about the other class, which is owned by the hospital. They generate revenues by performing services for patients, and they generate expenses to support those revenues. Or a retail outlet. They sell products chosen by corporate headquarters. But even though they've got a profit and loss, we still need to be careful about how we use that information. Remember that controllable versus non-controllable distinction from Chapter 11? Even though the division is a profit center, it doesn't mean it controls everything. It may be stuck with internal transfer prices, or saddled with overhead pushed down on it from corporate headquarters, or product prices purchased by headquarters buying departments. Again, for this type of division, we should be looking carefully at creating a reasonable budget and then comparing performance to that budget. Our last option is the investment center, and this is a profit center that has the ability to make its own investment and reinvestment decisions. So here we're talking about a standalone subsidiary that ultimately reports to corporate headquarters, but has its own executive team. So we've got General Electric, which owns GE Capital Services, which is essentially a great big honkin' bank. These folks are left pretty well to their own devices by GE's management team, so long as they aren't screwing things up. So here's where we can use our traditional financial measures, such as ROA and ROE. Of course, we need to keep in mind rational expectations for those figures. GE Capital will never have an ROA of more than 2 or 3%, and that's okay, because it's a bank. So those are some ways we can look at the financial results of our divisions and make judgments about how well those managers have done. Now, of course, the financial side isn't the only way that we can tell whether or not a firm is doing well. We can look at net income and earnings per share, and that certainly provides one way of looking at firm performance. But if we think about what it takes to be successful in the long term, that sometimes means investing today for payback in the future, such as R&D and advertising expense, for example, or increasing the level of testing we perform on our products before they go to the customer. Those are things that will show up on the income statement as negatives today, but will pay dividends in the future. If we slash our R&D budget, we may hit our earnings target this quarter, but in the long run, we're screwed when we run out of drugs in our pipeline. So this introduces the idea of non-financial performance measures. How can we look at the operations of the firm, or a division within the firm, in a way that gives us a more holistic vision of performance? And one of the biggies in this area is the balanced scorecard. This was conceptualized by a couple of guys at Harvard and has been developed over time to not just a performance evaluation tool, but also a general management tool. The balanced scorecard process begins with a specification of what our organization's vision is. That vision is typically broken into areas of financial performance and customer satisfaction and the like, and then we figure out what activities will help us achieve that vision. We develop measures, financial and non-financial, that indicate how well we are pursuing those activities, understanding that everything we do must ultimately result in higher long-term profitability. If our customers are happy, they will become repeat customers. If our employees are happy, they'll stick around longer, decreasing training costs. And if they're well-trained, they'll be better at cross-selling to our current customers, expanding our revenue base. And if our outreach is successful, we will continue to generate a stream of new customers. And the important thing is that these are division specific. What are the things that this particular division can do to help the company achieve that vision? Perhaps it's improved turnaround time on repairs, or it's reduced error rate in production, or improved cross-selling. So just like ABC, we're talking about some heavy duty stuff that's going to require quite a bit of effort from our executive team to develop, and even more effort from middle management and line staff to implement. And we've got to get buy-in from people up and down the organization, or else it'll flop. And then we need to be sure that we follow up with this stuff. If we tell a division that they're on track if they accomplish X, Y, and Z, we need to stick with that, even if that means that in the short term, financial results end up suffering. Because if we did our jobs correctly, their achieving X, Y, and Z will yield far higher profits in the future.
At the back of your packet is the balanced scorecard that I swiped from the Department of Energy Federal Procurement System, and this is a pretty standard one. This is essentially a cost center. The divisional mission, vision, and strategy are here in the center, and then we have these spokes radiating out of them. The customer focus, the financial focus, learning and growth for our employees, and internal business processes. Within each of these areas, they have a question that needs to be answered. Once they've got that answer, they have to develop measures to indicate whether or not they're being successful at achieving that goal. So then, we see their targets. They want their customers to be satisfied. They want their employees to be satisfied. They've got a whole herd of things over here that they want to excel at operationally. And then they break it down one step further. Here we are in the customer perspective. This is what we want to do. This is how it is that we're going to measure it. And this is what we're shooting for. If we hit that target, we're pretty sure that we're doing a good job and we're going to create value for the firm in the long run. If done well, this can be a hugely useful tool for an organization. If done poorly, or half-ass, or without buy-in from the middle managers who are ultimately responsible for implementing all this stuff, it's at best a distraction and at worst can be a serious sap on employee morale. There are other things that we can do that are less revolutionary in nature than the balance scorecard, primarily industry benchmarking. And the idea here is that we find some observable measure for our competitors or our industry and we see how it is that we match up. And if we don't match up well, we set a goal and try to achieve it. For instance, back in the 90s, Continental Airlines used to pay every employee from the baggage handler to the CEO 50 bucks each month that they were the number one on-time arrival airline, as rated by the FAA. And what does this do for us in a way that paying bonuses on net income doesn't? This gets at those employees who are down actually making on-time arrivals happen. The gate agents, the baggage handlers, the pilots. These are the people who see virtually no relationship between the work they do on any given day and the bottom line. But they can see how efficiently doing their jobs will turn planes around faster, or get those bags loaded and unloaded faster. And what does high on-time arrivals do for us? Increases business traveling because they need to get there on schedule, not to mention the cost savings from having fewer idle planes. Ka-ching, ka-ching! Another alternative that I'm sure we're all familiar with is the win-loss record for a coach. You ever hear of a coach being fired because the franchise isn't turning a profit? While winning teams generate more revenues, there's a lot more that goes into a team's bottom line than the actions of the coach. So if they win games, we keep them. If they lose games, we fire them. Simple enough. Now the last word on this is a warning, and that's the most important thing to remember. If you decide to use a non-financial measure for performance measurement, make sure that you actually use them. I remember reading a research paper on the balanced scorecard, and the experimenters found that when subjects were given a list of measures, both financial and non-financial, they typically zoned out on everything but net income and ROE. And while that experiment had its issues, most notably that the subjects weren't in on the development of the measures the way an executive team should be, it highlights a danger. Financial results are easy to read, and everyone understands what they mean in a way that's not necessarily the case with some measure of employee satisfaction. If you've done your job well and developed a proper measure that has a cause and effect relationship with future financial performance, then stick with it. Because the employees are going to learn pretty quickly what you really care about. And if all you care about is the bottom line, you can bet they're going to ignore all those other measures that you told them to work on. Wouldn't you do the same? A former student of mine worked for a firm with a balanced scorecard system, but all performance measurement was based purely on net income and he reported pretty much exactly that. No one paid any attention to the non-financial measures anywhere within the firm. So that's where we'll leave things. With this final class under your belt, you can now dive into the fourth assignment, which is an activity-based costing case. Check the course folder for the download and for more information. I hope that you've enjoyed this course and that you found it educational. I welcome any feedback you may have about the course, and I wish you the best of luck in your pursuit of your graduate business studies. Peace out, yo.